welcome to episode 76 of the Bitcoin Game, sponsored by eToro. I'm Rob Mitchell. Oh wait, let me take off my respirator. I think I'm safe in here. Today's interview is with Andrew Tierney, otherwise known as Cyber Gibbons. Andrew hacks everything from oil rigs at his day job to cryptocurrency hardware wallets and smart locks in his free time. We conducted this interview a bit before COVID-19 had taken over the planet. You know, back in the good old days a few weeks ago, when we were more worried about malware than going to the grocery store without an N95 mask. Andrew and I discuss hacking hardware wallets, general security, IoT devices, home routers, his day job as a hacker for hire, and other stuff too. I hope you enjoy. Hello. Hello. Awesome. Well, it's working. So do I call you Andrew or Cyber Gibbons, or how do you like to go? I tend to go by Andrew. Uh, Cyber Gibbons is just the handle. Um, it's it's very strange when people uh, pe- you meet people and you, you I, I can't remember their names half the time. You you meet so many people via Twitter, you can go years without actually knowing someone's name. But yeah, Andrew Andrew's the normal one. Okay, Andrew Tierney. Yep. I know I was watching you back with the Bitfi wallet from John McAvee, and it was quite dramatic. I mean, it was crazy and i actually thought oh you must just be some secretive guy and no one knows who you are the way you're poking at john mcafee's stuff like you you didn't seem very nervous about it i think mcafee he's kind of uh he talks a lot he he posts a lot on twitter he likes his guns but you know fundamentally he still is only one guy paying some others to to kind of protect him and you know he's, he's the other side of the world um I never had any intent to actually go and visit him in his house. That that, that was something I certainly wouldn't go and do. <laughs> okay. There's been, there's been plenty of stories about things that he's done. We did put it to him to come to London. Um, uh, we, we had a couple of journalists interested in, in filming the whole thing to see if we could actually carry out the attacks. Um, but yeah, he wouldn't, he wouldn't take us up on that. So uh, that was a bit of a shame. He was in London actually recently. Um, he, he sent out a tweet saying he was going to have a, have a, a a meeting with people to email him and i emailed him and didn't get any response back I'd, I, again i'd have gone and met him in london it, it, it's quite hard to get guns into the uk <laughs> so i think that the worst that could happen would be would be some mean words said all right well my head goes to i don't know he pays some um, one with some i don't know military training to uh to do something to you i don't know but... yeah may, may, maybe in retrospect um poking someone like that can cause them to do irrational things um he he certainly had people involved with him who were, were ex-military but then i think one of them one of them supposedly ran off with a load of his cryptocurrency as well but then how much of it's true you you never know with mcafee he's um i think he likes having that that story all these things happen to him people out to get him and things like that but it, it, I don't know. It was an interesting chapter anyway. Well, my takeaway was that, oh, you must be some totally pseudonymous character that we don't know who you are to talk like that. And so I was kind of surprised to realize, oh, no, you you go by Andrew. <laughs> yeah, I think a lot, quite a few people have been surprised by that. Um, I mean, I gave up. I, I've been using that handle for, well, 24 years maybe now. Um, and, you know, so many people know who I actually am and, you know, my my professional life is is so intimately linked to to that twitter account now that it, you know it's almost impossible to to be anonymous so there was a team of us so the the whole bitfi bitfi i don't know if it's bitfi or bitfi the whole there was a big group of us that worked on it um to be honest i, I didn't actually really do much technical uh on on the project um there were a few people who did want to remain anonymous I, I remember uh, like Abe Snowman or something like that. Abe's not anonymous either. Um, he's been someone that um, has been a Twitter contact for, for quite a long time. Essentially, I just put a shout out there and we just got a load of people involved who were uh, interested in the project. So we had um, Abe, um, we had Oversoft from the Netherlands, uh, Salim, um, who's a, a guy from the UK. A young guy, right? Yeah, young guy. Um, yeah, he was he, he was still at school developing this. He's he's one of the most. Um, he's very intelligent. He's and he's also got a, a great knack at finding vulnerabilities in um, wallets that that other people would would simply miss. Um, his his other work on stuff's just been just been brilliant. His work on Ledger, Trezor, um, and some yet to be disclosed stuff is is just fascinating. Ooh, you um, know stuff about this, huh? Yeah, he's um. He, he's keeping on going at it. 
Um, he's he's got he's got more more stuff in store. I don't think anything's ever going to be quite as as serious as, as as the issues that have been found yet. Not not in any of the mainstream wallets anyway. Were you going to say something about all those names? Yeah, so there was Salim. Um, there was a couple of my colleagues, um, some some of which he wanted to remain anonymous. Um, who else was there? I kind of lost track, to be honest. Oh, yeah, um, Shadow Ops as well. Quite oddly, both Abe and Shadow Ops went to work for BitFi. Well, that's what I, I remember being so confused when I saw Abe seeming to be uh, suddenly now working for them. That was very confusing to me as a bystander. Yeah, I'll, I'll be honest. When when it first happened, we we were kind of like we thought, you know, have have we been have we been had here? Um, you know, ha, ha, has he been spying and stuff? But I, in retrospect, I've, I you know I, I have no doubt about his integrity. I think Abe just really wanted to to help them. It, it, it's been interesting. Um, they've they've definitely kind of changed their tone um, bit fine in, in the recent kind of like year or so. Um, they've they've definitely started looking at things a bit more realistically. And, and it's funny you, you're mentioning that as things are coming back to me. Like whoever was on their Twitter handle was fairly cocky and fairly probably not their technical person. I have a feeling and and just throwing stuff out that you guys were just. I mean, really taunting you guys. It felt like back. Just as much. yeah. It, I mean, that that was what made it interesting to me. I I I do like it when people start reacting on Twitter. Um, it, it can turn. It can turn something from being like quite an uninteresting vulnerability into something fascinating when you see how people respond negatively. Um, I think you're completely right, though. The the guy operating the Twitter account, who who we always thought was the CEO, Daniel Kaysen, we're not we're, we're not entirely sure, but you know, I, I think I think it links up with with everything else. Um, it, he he wasn't the developer of the product. Um, the the developer's a, a guy, Michael Strong, um, who. I've actually had quite a few interactions with recently, um, and he's 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 a totally different character. I think a lot of the the issues that were in the product were were more born out of naivety, um, not not realizing that these kind of attacks were possible. Um, but I, I believe the CEO Daniel was 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 convinced the product was unhackable. He just didn't he didn't realize that that what we were saying was true. Well, it's definitely interesting to follow it as technically a non-technical person, but uh, you make me realize that, you know, something can sound like make sense until you hear someone who knows what they're doing, like tear it apart and like, oh, yeah, um, I guess it's not that great. This is the thing. A lot of these new hardware wallets, it's very difficult to compare the security in absolute terms. Uh, You know, you can't say that one wallet is more secure than another. Uh, Really, all all you can say is they're doing things differently. Um, you know, BitFi's concept was it, it, it's essentially a brain wallet. You remember the phrase that generates your keys and you enter that. That's a very different concept, say, Trazor or Ledger that store your keys in a, a secure box. Um, and then we've got different systems like BC Vault, the one that came up recently. Um, you've got all these different ways of doing things. Um, and it, it's very hard to compare them. You can't you can't really say one is so much better than the other, um, and I think that's that's where a lot of them fall down. They kind of um, their marketing's all about deriding their competitors rather than just saying that they're pretty good. I mean, I, I've said this for for ages. Nearly all people who ho- hold cryptocurrency are much better off using a hardware wallet than not using a hardware wallet. Whether that's Trazor or Ledger, it, it doesn't really matter for most people. They're both a massive improvement over storing your keys on your computer, a USB stick, or, or whatever you're doing. Sure, just to get it offline, basically. Yeah, get it so that you can't have it attacked um, via malware on your computer, really. I mean, that, that's, that's, that's what I think the... Well, the two big threats are malware on your computer, harvesting keys or seed words or something like that um uh, and the other one's uh, online storage of cryptocurrency with an exchange um you know all these different companies allowing you to store crypto online okay it's great for convenience but essentially that just means you're you're, you're trusting someone else with your your money um and as we've seen with all the hacks um yeah there's there's a lot of people interested in stealing funds uh from cryptocurrency holders and I just, yeah, you need that protection of a hardware wallet. While I agree, I also like to be a little bit devil's advocate because I, I think it is all trade-offs. And, and um, yeah. some people 
I, I maybe don't trust to, to hold a private key themselves, and maybe it's better to find a <laughs> someone with a track record like Coinbase to to hold it for you. Yeah. I, I guess it depends. So, I mean, I, I don't think cryptocurrency is for everybody. Um, so what, one of the issues is as soon as you start holding cryptocurrency, you, you've essentially become your own bank. You know, the security of your keys, um, both in terms of leaking them to someone else who can steal your funds or just losing them, it, it's down to you now. I mean, one of the, the, the big threats, I think, with cryptocurrency is it gets more and more popular is, is people are going to are going to lose their keys they're going to make mistakes when they're transferring funds from one place to another funds can just vanish and no one can recover them um, and taking that responsibility on yourself is, is quite a big thing really and i'll be honest a lot of the hardware wallets the, the user interfaces do make it easy to make mistakes what kind of mistakes have you seen uh, or possibilities <laughs> the simple one is not backing up your seed words um, people don't back those up. Their their wallet will fail, and they've lost their keys, and that's it. They they can no longer access their funds. I mean, if you go to any of the Reddit um, Reddit's for any of these hardware wallets, you see people doing this um, all of the time. It's fairly easy to make mistakes when you're you're moving funds from one place to the other. I mean, if you look at uh, cryptocurrencies like uh, IOTA, um, which I know is pretty edge case. But, you know, if you reuse the same address in IOTA, you start leaking your keys and things like that. It's very easy to make little mistakes that aren't aren't so obvious. And there's no one you can turn to to go. You can't you can't call up and say, you know, that 10 grand I just transferred to this incorrect address. I kind of need it back. You can do that with your bank. Um, You can't do that with cryptocurrency. Um, So, yeah, I I agree. The, The the online exchanges can have can have benefits. Depending who you are, yeah. There's Depending so on who threat, you are, yeah. Threat, and threat models, what you're worried about. If you're worried about seizure of your funds, I mean, then you yeah, know, yeah. Um, yeah. I'd be real curious to back up because when I saw you interacting with the bit fee, if my rec- recollection is correct, um, the keys actually somehow lingered in some kind of memory after they were not even you know supposed to be accessible anymore. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, so the the fundamental concept of it was that you you entered uh, a a seed and a phrase and from that it would generate your cryptocurrency keys um and then they could be used to sign transactions now those keys have to exist in memory for for at least a finite period um the, there's there's no real way to avoid that that i know of um and 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 that was what we were working on um that those keys had to exist in memory and and could we recover them so they existed in the memory for um, for quite a long time, it turned out, originally. Um, so the device made that calculation. Um, it's, it stored them in the RAM of the device, and then it would stay in the RAM. Um, I think the longest we managed to see them persist in RAM was about three weeks on a powered-up device. So on, it's essentially a phone. It's an Android phone. And there's a lot of different layers um, between... Uh, an Android app running on the device, which is what the BitFi wallet actually is, and the physical memory. So we kind of, we bypassed all of those controls, went direct to the memory, read it all out, and we found the keys just stayed about for a very, very long period of time. Now, the problem was, was when we first looked at it to access those keys, we we had to already have root access to the BitFi. Now, it was, we found it quite easy to root the device um, it, you plug in a USB cable, you ran a script that, that modified some parts of the file system, and we had root access. Okay, and can you just explain what root access means? Yeah, so um, a normal Android device, um, you, you run as a, a conventional user. So all your apps, the way you interact with it, you're a normal user. You don't have access to everything. You're not like a super administrator on the device. And what you can do on Android phones is you can root them, and root's the, the Linux Android super user it can do everything on that device now a lot of phones make it quite challenging to gain root um, and it is possible to make getting root very difficult on a phone quite often it involves going into the phone changing some settings uploading new software to it patching this patching that doing lots of complex stuff but on the bitfi all we needed to do is plug in a usb cable download a, a kind of the the first bit of software that runs on the device modify it and then re-upload it and we gained that that really high level of privilege, allowing us to directly interact with the memory, to see what the app was doing, to, to really poke and prod it. Um, it was that root access that let Salim run Doom on the BitFi. Um, hmm. So that was kind of our first stage. The, the Doom thing was just to, to demonstrate that 
we could do make the device do things that that it probably shouldn't do gotcha. um, with that root access we could read the ram and and we could then see what people had done now that that allowed what we call it an evil made attack um, so someone with access to your bitfy could um, modify the software on it so that it harvested your keys from the memory and then sent them somewhere else but obviously that needs someone to have physical access to your device prior to you using it which is a valid threat really Uh, yeah i agree (laughs) so i I think actually it's the more valid threat but what bitfi wanted us to to demonstrate the attack that they placed more um more weight on was what we call a cold boot attack now that would be where we walk up to a device that you'd previously used um and we recover your keys from it so we don't backdoor it and then give it back to you we steal it from you and then we take the keys off it and Bitfi had made a, a faulty assumption. They assumed that to gain root access on the device, uh, the keys in the RAM would be wiped because you'd have to restart the device to root it. But it turns out that most devices, when you restart them, don't actually wipe the RAM. They just leave the contents there. They restart. It might get overwritten by something else, but the contents that was there before you restarted it and after, they're, they're both there. So what Salim found was he managed to write a script that could reset the device, root it, read the keys out from RAM, unroot the device, and then it would just be back to normal and we'd have the keys. We found that you could wait really quite significant periods of time and the keys would still be there sat in RAM. Um, You could mitigate the threat. You could power off the device. Um, So you turn the power off on the device, wait a couple of minutes, and you're, you're almost guaranteed that the contents of RAM has gone at that point. But that was that cold boot attack. That that was being able to walk up to a device that someone had used and recover their keys. I'll be honest, I think the evil maid was a more significant threat. Um, it, it would have been completely feasible for us to um, have ordered 100 bit files off the internet, backdoor them, and then resell them. And those person's keys would then be sent to us. Um, but the attack only took seconds to backdoor it. You know, Realistically, we're talking under a minute to get the whole thing done. And um, it was acknowledged that you had, I guess, accomplished the mission of the cold boot attack? Um, I, I don't think they ever really actually acknowledged it. They, they acknowledged that we managed the evil maid attack. But for, the, for that cold boot attack, they, they, they wouldn't really acknowledge that we'd done it. I've, I don't think I've, I've seen them say that anywhere. We technically didn't really meet their conditions for their... They had a bounty. Um, I can't even remember how... It's like a million dollars, right? Wasn't it a lot? It was. Oh, it, it, it was. A, it was a significant sum, but to carry out that attack, you had to carry it out against a wallet that they sent to you. Right. So right. they used a wallet, um, and the the issue there is that it, it it's simulating one very specific attack, which is them using a wallet and sending it to you. Now, to ensure that cold boot isn't possible, you power it down, leave it powered down for for a day, and then send it out. And now we've got no chance of carrying out that attack. But it doesn't really provide any assurance to your actual users that the device is is safe from cold boot. Yeah, again, Um, that's another interesting thing where you could see like, hey, we have this bounty. No one's able to do it. That's pretty good proof, but it's really not. Yeah, um, we're seeing this a lot at the moment. Um, People people set up these bounties, um, sometimes with really significant sums, sometimes with, with token sums. And they they say that because the bounty is not being claimed, they're they're secure, and it just it just doesn't add up, to be honest. Can I ask uh, also with the bit fee fi just working on? I guess it's it's Android hardware, basically. Is, that's what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it was a MediaTek chipset, a fairly standard Android phone. Uh, you could see on the PCB. Yeah. So it, that in my head seems way too complex with way too many chances for something to go wrong or uh, yeah yeah so i mean in your in your mind I, I, is it am i on the right track that it should be more custom or less chips less stuff going on yeah yeah completely um it, it it's very difficult to build uh, a, a highly secure uh complex device that runs android there's so many different attack vectors um you, you just have to look at look at all the different attacks that come out against phones um there can be attacks against wi-fi usb 
uh, side loading malicious applications onto it, vulnerabilities in the Android operating system itself. Um, Android has to be kept up to date with security patches to make sure it's not vulnerable to certain things. How do they get through to the wallet? The physical hardware is complex. So you've got things like serial ports and external memory, a JTAG, which is like a hardware debug port, all these different things on it that just increase what we call the attack surface that make it harder to secure. And if you compare it to something like the Ledger, Trezor that use much, much smaller microcontrollers uh, with, with constrained software on them, it's much easier to be uh, be assured that the security of these is good compared to the complete Android operating system. Since you did bring up uh, Trezor, I mean, obviously they don't have a secure element and... Yeah. I mean, if, if someone's not encrypting or basically adding additional like <laughs> entropy or something with a encryption, how long does it take to get a key off a uh, Trezor? Yeah, so I think that's a that's an interesting point. So the the, the Trezor uses um, a, a microcontroller called an STM32, um, which is a, a really common processor. We see them in IoT devices, they're in watches, they're, they're, there's probably several in your house already, um, but they're general purpose microcontrollers. They're not built for security. And historically, there's been lots and lots of different ways of gaining access to aspects of that microcontroller that you, you, you shouldn't be able to access. So they store your keys in flash memory inside the chip. So it's physically contained inside a chip. And that, that does make it a little bit harder to access. But there's just been so many different ways that with physical access to the device, you can recover those keys. Um, so the most recent one that, that seems to be gaining quite a lot of traction is, is called glitching. You can either alter the clock, the voltage, uh, you can do something called electromagnetic fault injection, and it causes the device to behave in an incorrect manner. Uh, and it bypasses these security controls and you can, you can read the keys out. But that's, that, that's a physical attack. Um, someone needs to steal your device um, they need to then be capable of carrying out this attack. The, the most recent ones, I mean, you're looking at maybe maybe a couple of hundred pounds worth of equipment that's readily available. And there's there's a significant number of people who are capable of carrying out that attack. So yeah, Trazor does have that downside. Um, someone with prolonged physical access to your device can likely recover um, your keys that raises another interesting point with hardware wallets is that they they make it difficult for you to detect whether your keys have been stolen or not. If, say, for example, you store your hardware wallet in a safe, someone gains access to the safe and steals your hardware wallet, how do you detect that? How do you know someone's got the keys off it? The first time you're going to realize is either when you go to use it and find it's gone or you find your funds have been stolen by someone. And that not being able to detect something happening is a bit of an issue there you know if you if you can detect that someone's compromised your keys your your action should be to transfer your funds somewhere safe um which you can do with your backup but if you don't know that someone's stolen your wallet you can't do anything about it are there solutions you have in mind for this well the the way that the, the trezor um recommend solving this is is you can essentially encrypt your keys so you have another source of 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 secret material that you don't store on trays or you have to enter it every single time. So you're, you're mixing another source that only you know. Um, so ideally you don't store that with your, your hardware wallet. Okay. I'm going to be devil's advocate though and say, well, why not just enter your seed words again on a bit fee or something? I mean, it's, you got to bring a secret with you to, to use it. Right. I think the thing is there then, then to obtain it, you need to know the secret. You need to have the device. You need to, you need to have that specific device. So you're just making those attacks harder and harder. Um, I mean, I quite, I quite like the model of um, something you have and something you know being those two factors. Obviously, in isolation, if you make that, that something you know so long and complex that you're writing it down and storing it with your wallet, it, it, it's not going to be any more secure than, than it would be otherwise. And it does have to be contrasted with Ledger. As you mentioned, Ledger uses a secure element, um, which is a, a dedicated chip that has the specific purpose of storing keys and making them inaccessible to others. And they've actually got quite a good track record. Most of the secure elements haven't allowed people to easily access keys inside them. So Ledger's adopted that model. 
which means that if someone does steal your device, I think, you know, as it stands today, unless they're the NSA or someone of similar capability, there's not much chance of them getting those keys off there. Um, so different security model, more secure against physical attacks, um, which, you know, if that, that's your threat model, if you're worried about someone stealing your hardware wallet, then then Ledger could be a better solution for you. Gotcha. And that lead, yeah. leads on to more interesting things. If you, I, I don't think for most people it should be a big concern thinking that someone's going to physically access your wallet and extract keys. Um, if you've got enough funds, maybe someone might do that. But if someone's willing to go to the lengths to steal your hardware wallet, what lengths are they willing to go to full stop? Are they willing to physically attack you? You know, fundamentally someone has to have access to the cryptocurrency and if they can if they can get all the information out of you the pin the keys whatever they can access your funds so i think when you start bringing in physical threats like that it, it can get quite hard to protect against yes difficulties of being your own bank yeah yeah definitely hence a lot of gun photos with american bitcoiners i guess yeah that's something something i have noticed uh, a bit of a correlation <laughs> It, it, it is an interesting link. I think um, a, a lot of people who like cryptocurrency are a bit anti-establishment as well, and it kind of goes hand in hand. Um, I think that's quite a uniquely uh, American thing, though. The following message is sponsored by eToro, the official platform of the Bitcoin game. Are you interested in getting into the cryptocurrency markets but don't know where to start building your portfolio? eToro has the answer for you. It's called Copy Trader. With Copy Trader, you can automatically copy every trade of eToro's top crypto traders at the exact price in real time. No need to study up on markets or develop your own strategies. Simply sign up and copy the trader of your choice. Any profits they make, you do too, proportional to your investment. With eToro, you get access to the world's most popular cryptocurrencies with transparent trading fees, all in one easy-to-use app. Copy the smart money with eToro. Join now at b.tc forward slash eToro game. That's b.tc forward slash e-t-o-r-o-g-a-m-e. I don't think hacking cryptocurrency wallets is your day job. Like, what, what's, what do you do? Um, I'm a, a security consultant with a penetration testing firm. Um, I, I lead the hardware team there. So we, we have a, a, a dedicated team that works with um, all, of the, all of the things that need information security that aren't, um, aren't general purpose computers. So that's... Uh, Internet of Things devices, uh, industrial control systems, cars, ships, planes, wh wh whatever comes along, really. So the, wh whilst hardware wallets aren't, aren't really a kind of core speciality of ours, hardware wallets are just really another embedded device. So um, it, it, it's, something that, it's something that we do, um, but it's not, it's not kind of our speciality. I'll be honest, we, we did get some interest um, immediately after the whole BitFi thing. Some people who are making hardware wallets did did come to us to to ask for testing, but but none of them none of them went went with it. So so where that went, I don't know. Is it maybe uh, a budget thing? I think it could be. Um, pen testing isn't cheap, and uh, to test to test a, a hardware wallet system front to back. Um, say something really complex where you've got firmware, the device itself, a web app, a mobile app, possibly, you know, you're, you're looking at 20 or 30 days worth of, of effort to do that, which is, is a lot. And it, yeah, for a small startup that, that can just, just be too much, to be honest. Again, that, that leads into to interesting differences between what we're, we're seeing on the market at the moment with, you've got, you've got people like Trezor who open up their firmware so anybody can look at it and, and find vulnerabilities and improve it. You've got Ledger who are, who are a bit closed source. They use a secure element you can't look into. And you've got these people who are just completely black box. You know, they, they tell you nothing about how they operate, but it's, yeah, it, it's certainly not, not something we've seen a, a lot of interest in. Um, I've been surprised. I mean, I, I think if, 
if you if you look to several of the vulnerabilities that have been found in these devices a, a pen test would have found them and it, you know if if, if bitfire had uh, had 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 a pen test prior to going to market um, a lot of the issues we found could have been maybe not completely solved but mitigated um you know may fix fixed, fixed the extent that the device would have been a lot better but but they they made the choice not to do that I'm imagining their budget wasn't huge, and that maybe would have been a decent percentage of their budget, which they didn't expect. You, what do you think? Yeah, yeah, I think I think it would be a, a big, big chunk um, of of their budget. I mean, when you you know an injection molded case is is probably and getting the molds made for that is probably going to be about the same amount of money as a pen test. Um, one of them's essential; <laughs> the other ones are nice to have. Um, so you know, it's it it, it do, probably does come down to choices like that. Is one of the things that that we're we're trying to do. Um, I think people generally call it pushing left, which is getting uh, advice around security earlier in the design process. Uh, what what we tend to find is that uh, you know a twenty day pen test of a finished product is worth about one day of advice right at the beginning of the project. So we can tell them things that they should and shouldn't do, mistakes they could make, things things that we see other people doing. They might not get that pen test at the end of it, but that one day can give so much advice. But again, it, it's difficult to convince people to do that. There's a lot of um, people like their intellectual property when it comes to, to hardware wallets as well. You know, a lot of them have got kind of like novel ideas that that they don't want to tell anybody about. Um, so again, early on the development, they want to keep everything in house, make sure no one knows about what's going on. Interesting. You had said you actually have hacked on a ledger, right? I haven't. I haven't. Slim carried out a, a couple of attacks against Ledger, which were, were were really quite interesting attacks. I did look at Ledger, and I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm fairly confident that it's adequately secure. You had said, you know, uh, they try to black box everything, and I'm just curious, like, how much is someone like yourself or Salim able to dig and actually understand what's going on? It's challenging. They use the secure element, and and. To all intents and purposes, that is completely a, a black box, really. Um, you can't get any full data sheets for it. Um, you need to be under NDA um, to get hold of those. But even with that NDA access, you still don't really find out how it works inside. A lot of people who do know how it works have tested it. That's not to say it can't have vulnerabilities, but we're quite confident. Um, but then the ledger has got the secure element, but then it's also got a, a normal microcontroller on it um, that interfaces with that secure element. And it, it's in that normal microcontroller that vulnerabilities have been found in the past. Mm-hmm. So that, that secure element essentially acts like a, a tiny little black box, it stores your keys. You ask it to sign or encrypt something and it will do it. So it's really important that the thing requesting um, that data signed or encrypted is also secure. I mean, some of the some hardware wallets um, don't have displays on them. Um, and it, it's an absolutely vital bit of security that, you know, if 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 your computer's telling you you're sending one Bitcoin to someone, but it's actually instructing your hard wallet to send 100 Bitcoin, um, without that display, you've got no way of telling what the wallet's actually doing. There's a, a few kind of unsolved problems um, with hardware wallets, and it, it'd be great to see see something doing that really quite quite well. I mean, fundamentally, you've always got to place a degree of trust in whoever makes the wallet. You know, the firmware running on the device has to has to be genuine and not be doing anything malicious. And if, if the hardware can be backdoored, you've got a problem. No, no one's really kind of solved that. All of these systems still involve kind of taking a leap of faith and trusting that that wallet you receive is genuine. The other thing that I think is a bit unsolved with wallets is, is backing the backing the keys up. Um, they they nearly all make you write down your your bit thirty nine words on on a bit of paper and store them somewhere else, um, which is is a bit troubling to be honest. Um, you know, some, how come? Well, if someone gets access to that piece of paper, it, it's game over. Um, you know, they they can they can do do anything with that. Um, so as well, that piece of paper gets destroyed. Um, you've lost access if you you don't have the wallet. So I think um, it'd be good to see hardware wallets doing something novel um, to allow them to be backed up both in a a way that makes them available, um, but but also secure. Um, I think, I think earlier on you, you uh, on, on Twitter, you mentioned um, 
uh, a new wallet that seems to be trying to solve that that problem by storing your backup on um, what look like smart cards. And I think the idea is that you can have four different cards and you only need two of them to actually restore your keys. But you need more than one of them, which is a really interesting idea. So stuff like that is, is interesting. I think they're looking for people uh, to attack it. Should I tell them to, to talk to you? Or no, you get you would need to be paid quite a bit. You yeah, don't want to we, <laughs> d- d- despite what happened with BitFi and, and things like that, we, we, don't, we don't do the work for free. BitFi took took a number of days to develop that attack, um, but it, it didn't cover all bases. So, you know, a, a proper security test on one of these products covers something that we call it defense in depth. We're not just looking for that that single exploit that, that gains press interest. What we're looking for is all of the issues, you know, so that people can really make sure their product's secure. And I think, yeah, this, this is why these bounties and challenges and things like that just um, just just don't feel don't feel the right way to do things so what you'd like to see is hey show us a security audit from someone who's trustworthy in this field or yeah completely um i i, th- I think that's probably probably the the best way forward i mean um there, there was one wallet recently that, that did release a, a security audit and it found a, a number of issues in the device a couple of them were, were pretty much unexploitable one of them essentially you could overwrite some memory that you shouldn't be able to, but that couldn't be really turned into anything significant. But the, I think the the big issue is you could downgrade the firmware on it. So you could take an older firmware and put it back onto the device, which is, is an attack that, that can be difficult to protect against. But it's great they, they, they've had that audit and the pen test report was published as well, which is quite a bold move. I think if you, if you get a pen test that's only got a few results on it and you publish it, that flags to the rest of the security community um, it says, well, they didn't manage to hack it. What can I do to it? Um, how can I show those guys up? How can I say that that they they didn't manage to find an issue? Mm. So it does, does kind of paint a target on your back to a certain extent. But I think it's a much more positive way of doing things, publishing a report that's got some issues in it, rather than just saying, yeah, we've had an audit and it was completely clear. Uh, when people say that, when we're secure, you think oh, something's not quite right there. You know, n- nothing's completely secure. There's, there's always some issues in a system do you have any general gut feelings to people trying to implement multi-sig with current uh technology it's just very challenging to get right in a way that's usable um i mean the, the, this is the other factor with with security the, the fundamentally the device has to be has to be usable by normal people um I think most most cryptocurrency holders are, are, are relatively computer literate, but they're not developers. They're not, you know, still a load of Windows users. And and using using some of these wallets when you start doing, th- I mean, just trying to do multi sig anyway, isn't the easiest thing in the world. And when you start introducing hardware and other systems like that, it, it becomes becomes difficult to get right. And it, it'll be interesting to see where it goes. To be honest. And it's all stuff I've been exploring. It's just as a user, um, I, I finally got around to watching this kind of demo video of Caravan. Um, is that Unchained Capital? Open source Caravan, Unchained. Yeah, okay, Unchained. Yeah, okay, there we go. Um, I found it fascinating. Like it's, it seemed like it was starting to make things approachable to me. Um, like it made me want to play around with it. Um, yeah, it looks really interesting. It's not something something I've looked at before. Um, so. Yeah, I'll they'll, they'll have a read about that. I think um, I think stuff like that is really positive. Um, I, you know, cryptocurrencies aren't going to go away anytime soon, and m- multi-sig is is one of those things that we just you can't really do with conventional currency. Um, you know, th- there's no way to really cryptographically secure uh, transactions. You can have multiple uh, authentication, but fundamentally, at the heart of it, a bank's got control of being able to move funds you know, without your say so. Um, whereas multi-sig makes that impossible. So yeah, it'd be, be interesting to see where that kind of thing goes. And do you have a gut reaction um, between trying to split keys using multi-sig versus Shamir's secret sharing? Not really. Um, it's, th- this is the thing with, with, with Bitcoin, there's so many new developments um, and so many things that people want to do with it. And, 
I guess my concern is when, whenever you introduce anything that, that starts making it more complex like this, um, there's a risk you introduce vulnerabilities in and of themselves. So the, the fundamental technology that, that Bitcoin relies on is kind of, it's, it's quite reliable um, and it's, it uses very well understood cryptographic primitives. Whereas you move on to things like multi-signature and triple S, it's all, it's all stuff that we've never really used before. It's things that are kind of starting to get towards the edge of cryptography where we've not really fully understood the implications and there could be vulnerabilities there. And it, it, that does kind of worry me. Um, I mean, we're also kind of getting to that stage where the, there's so many different things going on with new functionality in different cryptocurrencies. I think I think there's a risk of diluting the kind of core reason that these exist, which which is a currency. I mean, you just you look to to some other some other cryptocurrencies, and they they have these kind of like unique selling points. I mean, the the one I'm really familiar with, is IOTA, which which has this kind of core principle. It can be used for messaging between IoT devices and microtransactions and things like that. Um, but now you've got something that's acting as a currency and acting as a messaging system, and it they just they just don't run run hand in hand. Um, I do think Bitcoin's got got maybe bigger problems to solve that again I just can't think of solutions um at the moment it's it there's no there's no genuinely secure way of of building trust in a a, a network of people using bitcoin uh, it's still you still need to pass those addresses about using some other means and then you've got to again trust those based on where you're getting them from and at the moment we're generally using things like websites you know, if you if you see an address on someone's website uh, at the bottom of their YouTube uh, in their description asking for tips, you're taking that trust based off that being their channel and and the YouTube uh, YouTube site using TLS and things like that. And and most cryptocurrencies don't seem to be able to kind of solve trust in a decentralized way. So this is an interesting concern because I don't I don't believe I've ever heard uh, it raised before. I guess rather than getting on the phone and knowing the person and reading off a huge, huge string of digits, there's no way to really give someone the information to send you Bitcoin or whatever. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, exactly. So yeah, there's there's no way to really tell that the, the person you're sending money to is the person who they say they are. Um, you know, when you when you go to your bank's website, you you look up into your your uh, the browser address bar and you see that padlock. And you, you've, you're you're taking it on trust based on TLS certificates that the site's genuine. The problem is that's centralized. You're you're relying on a certificate store that's stored in your computer, which you've got from Microsoft or from whoever, and that that only certain people have signed certificates for that given address. And there's lots of complexity there, but it's centralized. Um, and you know, Bitcoin is is really decentralized. People aren't using it for microtransactions and or, or even just conventional transactions most of the time. But as we move towards that idea of of microtransactions, you know, being able to charge your car and pay with Bitcoin. If you walk up to a car charging point, how do I know who I should be paying for that electricity? If it's just an address written on the uh, written on the charging point, someone could have just replaced it with their own. There's no way to know that you should trust that, um, and I don't think anyone's really solved that yet. Yeah, I, I hear you. So I've got to wonder, every single app or hardware wallet, software wallet, they must use tons and tons of snippets of this and libraries of that. And that just seems like everyone probably has an insecurity because of some library with some flaw that someone hasn't found, right? Oh, yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, so, <laughs> you can yeah, argue we, with we, me on that if you want. I, I just, no, no, no. I'm completely in agreement. Um, so um, software supply chain issues like that are, are becoming huge everything around us becomes so complex that you can't actually you can't actually know everything that's going on inside the devices around you anymore it's crazy you look at the trazel um the bootloader the bit of code that's burnt into the chips isn't publicly available so again you know trazel got to take it on trust that st the maker of that chip has, has done the right thing there you know that that bit of code there's not not perfect if you look at the web apps or applications that drive most hardware wallets, a lot of them are based on systems that import lots of third-party code. One of the really big ones at the moment is Node, 
you build a project, it can pull in a hundred thousand lines of code, and you're not quite sure what any of them do. A few years ago, someone compromised uh, a node package that all, all it did was I think it padded a string on the left hand side. That was all it did. Someone compromised that, um, and it got imported into thousands of other projects and caused damage. Um, it, it's really hard to to know when things like that are going to happen. Um, again, it's one of those things I don't don't really have a solution for. You can either spend years validating everything, but that that stops you being able to to move quickly. Um, you know, being able to develop products and get them to market in a time that's acceptable. You know, it, it, it's really important. Uh, I think it's something that security does really badly sometimes as well. We place so much weight on security that we don't realise that there's no point in having a completely secure product if it doesn't go to market. Things only have to be adequately secure for the the threat model. They don't have to be perfect. They just have to be adequate. Yeah, software supply chains making that quite challenging to deal with though. It's kind of exciting when I get to speak to someone like you who could just answer so many little questions I have. Like things I always wonder. You tell me how realistic this is. I order, I don't know, a new little flash card or USB drive or something on Amazon and I plug it into my computer and I get hacked. I mean, it's certainly possible. It would be strange for someone to to carry out an attack like that without you being a target. So at the moment, I mean, you you can divide attacks into to untargeted ones. Lots of malwares like that. They they don't really care who they hit. Um, but you know, as long as 0.1% of people who who click on that link are infected, that's all they care about. They don't really care who it is. I guess my concern in this case would be some some manufacturer or someone <laughs> uh, just say, hey, let's dump all these things that's going to hack everyone's computers. Computers have got a lot better in dealing with like direct malware. So when you plug in a USB memory stick, if it's got an executable on there that's malicious, um, you know your computer no longer will run that automatically. Generally, malware protections on computers these days. So again, that, that's become less of a threat. But one of the tools we use um, during what we call red teams, where we, we go into a company to, to attack them. It's called a, a USB rubber ducky. What it does is it, it looks like a USB memory stick, but it behaves like a keyboard. So you plug it into your laptop and it will press Windows key and R to bring up the run dialog. And then it will type in a command that can do various things. And the most common one is it will, it will download um, some code from somewhere on the internet onto your computer and then run that and then establish a command and control channel through to your computer. So now we can control it. Uh, and it does take a couple of seconds. So when you plug it in, you know, you'll see the, the run dialogue pop up and things like that. But that, that can be a, a, a real problem. You know, it, it's quite hard to protect against as well because your laptop really has to support keyboards. You know, if you plug something in, there's no, it just looks like a keyboard to your laptop, but it, it starts typing and it starts typing bad things. Um, so the, the common one we do is it, we you use PowerShell, which is a scripting language built into to Windows. Um, so this is specific to Windows, not Mac or Linux or... Yeah, similar attacks can be carried out against Linux and Mac OS, but they're much less common. If you're looking at an attacker coming after you, you're buying something off Amazon and, and it doing something bad to your computer, they're going to want it to succeed against most computers. So they're going to go for Windows as the target operating system. Now, there are ways of working around that. You could have the, the stick detect the operating system, be quite challenging, and then change the payload based on, on what it is. But that's not something we're really seeing. Um, the other thing that people have is they, they have these USB killers um, so it's, it's just a USB stick that um, has some capacitors in it. You plug it in, it charges up, and then it dumps a massive voltage into your computer. For some computers, all it does is break the USB port. For others, it just takes out the entire computer. There's nothing stopping someone putting them in a USB memory stick. It could behave as a memory stick for, for three weeks and then suddenly kill your computer. You know, denial of service isn't the, the worst attack in the world, but it, it could cause you real problems. The other thing I worry about is there's so many, I guess, IoT devices or security cameras or baby monitors or what are thermostats. <laughs> yeah. And then I see so many of these things are from on Amazon, unknown Chinese companies. Um, I mean, a particular thing that I thought is weird is uh, there's a like FIDO2 security key that uh, is like a Yuba key, but it's a, a separate brand. And I see it 
everywhere. It's been recommended. But I was just curious when I looked and I couldn't see any information like why should you trust this company? And I don't know what the attack could be, but it just seemed to be some small little US face and clearly it was a Chinese product. And I was just like, huh. Yeah, it, 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 it does worry me, things like that. Taking a, a U2F token and it, doing something malicious it, it is possible, challenging, but possible. And as you say, a lot of hardware on Amazon is coming from untrusted sources. I mean, the the number of vulnerabilities we find in these products and, and the fly-by-night nature of some of the, the vendors, it, it's, it just boggles my mind. Last year, I, I ran some training for a company and they, they wanted to learn how to hack into IoT devices. And what I did was I bought a load of um, DVRs, so CCTV recorders um, from Amazon I bought eight or so of them and I found that one of them was really good for training people. It, had, it was really vulnerable. So I went and ordered another load of them. I think it took me two days and I went back to the same Amazon listing, clicked on the same item in my order history, ordered more of them. They turned up, I opened them and they were different inside. The case was the same. The circuit board was different. So within the space of days or, or depleting the amount of product in the warehouse, the device had changed. The firmware was different. It looked physically the same, but that was it on the outside. The rest of it was different. You've just got no way of telling. And the, the troubling thing is, as a, as a normal person, you've, you've got no way of telling if that product you're buying is secure or not. And I, I, don't think, um, I don't think many people really appreciate how easy it is to hack a lot of these devices and how harmful it can be for your mental state as well. Um, I mean, the, the, the one that's happening a lot recently is baby monitors or or some kind of camera you have in your house that people can talk through. And to be honest, most of these aren't, aren't technically hacks. It's normally someone using a bad password. Someone logs into the account and then they'll start saying creepy things to your kids. We recently tried helping someone that was having this happen through their, their camera system. And, and it can really scare you. I mean, the, the, the other weird thing I'm finding is that if, if we think about how our kind of our attitude to privacy has changed, if, if I go back to to when I was a teenager in the 90s, CCTV was popping up everywhere around London. But the concept of having a CCTV camera inside your house, inside your living room, just seemed absolutely ridiculous. But now people are installing cameras inside their houses. I mean, lots of people are installing cameras inside their houses. And I don't think we're ready for the kind of privacy implications of that. It's it's terrifying, to be honest. I sometimes feel like, We're softened up for that since most of our computers and phones have cameras and microphones and everything. It's kind of like, well, what's one more (laughs) inside our house? I I do notice that as an interesting attitude. Sometimes you speak to people and you say, would you you install a a camera in your house? No way. I'd never have a camera inside my house. And then you pick up their phone. So that's got two cameras on it. (laughs) You, You know, most people bring their phones into their bedroom at night as well. So it's like, it's definitely crossing that kind of privacy barrier. You know, these cameras, microphones, absolutely everywhere. So how do you personally deal with, you know, do you have your phone with you everywhere? Do you have any cameras in your house? I mean, you don't have to answer this, but I do use I do use some cameras. I only ever have them on inside my house when I'm not in my house to keep an eye on my cats. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so that's that's it. Um all of all the rest of them are external facing. Don't want to give too much away. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, they uh, they're not a major IoT platform. But the problem is is that a normal person just wouldn't be able to implement a system like this and be able to access it remotely. So they go for the easy option. They 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 walk into to the the big box store, buy a camera, and you've just got no idea what it's doing. Yeah, I I had one of those, the cheapest one I could find on Amazon. This is probably over ten years ago. It was opaque to me what was going on. There's a specific interface that I was able to finally somehow realize that it was Linux. And then I was hearing about all these Linux vulnerabilities and that any Linux computer connected was like, it seemed like a bad idea to have on my network. So I ended up just, uh, I didn't toss it. I probably have it somewhere, but I, I, oh yeah, you know what? I, it's still recording to a hard drive, but it's disconnected. Um, yeah, from the network. And it's a real pain in the ass if I ever want to look at it because it's not connected to my network. Yeah, exactly. I mean, th- th- this is the thing. You- you've traded off usability for security there. Um, and But it- you kind of had to go through a conscious thought process. You had to understand that it was a little Linux computer 
and you know for a lot of consumers they you say linux then they'll be like well i've heard that word don't really know what it means again it, it's it's not something we've seen really yet but i can i can compromise a camera remotely and use it in its normal scope of operation as a camera which, which is obviously quite worrying to a user but now imagine i can compromise it and start using it as a tiny little computer to attack the rest of your network might not be such a concern for most consumers but if you're a high net worth individual or a business these things become real problems i mean we on a one of these red teams i mentioned we've compromised a fairly large business because they left their cctv system exposed to the internet and that had vulnerabilities in it that allowed us to gain access to their network from from afar but i don't think it crosses everyone's mind i'm always curious about routers do you have any rules of thumb on someone choosing a good router yeah avoid many of the the kind of big names you know i'll go go out there and say d-link netgear um belkin all of that lot you've just got no way really of knowing uh how good that device is in terms of security and they've just made so many mistakes historically um you tend not to get firmware updates for them um certainly not for long enough what can be good is buying one of those and putting open wrt or tomato which are kind of like open source uh, firmwares for them on there. But again, that's that's something quite challenging for a normal person to do. I mean, personally, I quite like the Ubiquiti uh, gear. That's had a fairly good security track record. Not everybody agrees with um, how they treat open source. They don't they don't really release or or kind of comply with GPL as far as I'm aware. So people don't like that. But security wise, they seem quite good. It's funny because uh, I have used one of those. And for me, still setting it up, like I, I followed a step-by-step online and didn't really know what I was doing and hoped it seemed to be a popular uh, thread or whatever it was. But uh, I've seen like you can buy popular routers with open source software on there. Is that an option that you recommend? Yeah. Again, I mean, you're taking on faith that that person hasn't done something bad to it, but I think, I think that's, that's a good way forwards. Um, you know, when you, when you use these, the, these open source firmwares, other people have looked at them. Um, they're generally minimized. The, a lot of the vulnerabilities in the kind of mainstream ones are due to like weird extra functionality that you'll probably never use. Um, and it just means you'll get updates as well. Um, you know, it's great that you can you can get three, four, five years of updates rather than, you know, two months that you get with a lot of other ones. I think I think that 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 is a valid way of going. I did I didn't know people were kind of routinely selling them, but it's it 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 removes a lot of the vulnerabilities. It's funny. I just have stare sometimes at all the router options and just like, how do you make sense of what the safest and best route to go is? It's really difficult. It would be great to see some of them adopt security practices, you know, to actually get their products pen tested to minimize the attack surface of these devices. I mean, we, we've done a lot of paid pen tests for kind of small, medium business routers, but they've never been paid for by the manufacturer. They've been paid for by a third party who wants to make sure they're secure. That's crazy. Yeah, it is crazy. It's not a thing to see people have some kind of audit information with their routers? No, it's not. Um, It's a big challenge we're facing in in the industry that we're in. A lot of companies white label products. Mm -hmm. So a a manufacturer will make the device and then they'll give it to to other companies who will either change the case or slightly change the firmware um, to make it their own. But the base of it comes from one manufacturer. And essentially, we've had the same product come to us multiple times to be tested and the manufacturer is fully aware of the findings that we found on the first test Um, so the next test we didn't expect to spend much time on it because we thought the vulnerabilities would 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 have just been fixed but no the same vulnerabilities were present Um, came around the third time and yeah same vulnerabilities were there Um, so you know from from our perspective we didn't perform multiple tests we did one test and 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 essentially customized it for our customers, but with, without having to charge them the full amount. It just seemed seemed ridiculous that the manufacturer didn't think, well, we should fix these issues for everybody who buys the product. Wow. Um, with the kind of work you do, I assume you must have some pretty good stories. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it, I mean, it's definitely an interesting job. You're very rarely doing the same thing from week to week. I think probably the the best stuff we've been doing in in, in recent memory has been working on ships uh, and maritime uh, installations. So I I used to work uh, on container ships um, quite a long time ago as an engineer, 
Um, and we've kind of like spun that knowledge into uh, maritime pen testing. Wait, wait, what does that mean to be an engineer on a, what'd you say, a container ship? Container ships, yeah. So um, I worked in the engine room fixing engines. Oh, an actual engine engineer. Yeah, an engine oh. engineer. Yeah, yeah. I you never hear about that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So th- th- that used to be what I did. Wow. But we're, we're applying that now. Um, and, and, and ships are, ships are absolutely fascinating. We, we've tested container ships, uh, offshore supply vessels. We, and, and last year we got free reign of an oil rig, which was one of the best jobs we've done. The oil rig was in what's called warm stack. So it's not drilling at that moment in time. It's still operating. It's still powered up and there's still a skeleton crew on board ready to be used, but it's not operating. So we were kind of told, look, you can break stuff on there. As long as you don't sink it, as long as you don't set it on fire, we're fine with that. Just go to town on it. So we spent several weeks working on an oil rig. And I mean, the sheer size and scale of that was just mind boggling. And the vulnerabilities we found were, were were brilliant. Essentially, we managed to, from from the perspective of any one of the oil rigs in that company, gain access to any other one of the rigs and then bridge onto what's called the drilling control network. So that's all the bits that control the actual drilling package in the middle. Um, so we could then interact with all the industrial control systems, uh, change how they operate, brick devices, stop it working. It was quite mind boggling. But yeah, the, sh- the ships are brilliant. They're, they're unique because when a ship's at sea, generally there's not actually anybody on board who deals with IT. It works and when it breaks, someone will do something to make it work again. And quite often that isn't the most secure way of doing things. So we find lots of what we call shadow IT and zombie IT. So that's like people putting in little systems or wires or or devices to make their lives easier. Things like uh, installing TeamViewer on a computer at the other end of the ship. So you don't have to leave the accommodation to go down and do something. But that, that TeamViewer connection's open to the internet. So anyone on the internet knowing the PIN number for that TeamViewer can connect into that computer and start messing about with it. A couple of times we've managed to gain access to the controls of the vessel remotely. So we'd be able to start engines, stop engines and things like that without being on the ship, which is quite a scary concept. Definitely targeted attacks, though. Did you actually do this? We demonstrated it, but we, we didn't. We were on the ship at the time. <laughs> so um, you've, you've got to be very careful. So, yeah, we we had access to the, you, they're, they're called HMIs, human machine interfaces. So it's, it's a screen that you can press a button, stop an engine or open a valve. We had access to that from the internet. So all it would require was us to, to start clicking buttons and doing things. Massively targeted attack, though. You know, that's not the kind of thing that someone would have found trivially. It took us all our years of working with things like this, plus uh, a lot of access to those systems to work out how to carry out that attack. Once we worked out how to do it, you could do it. So it's really good fun. Ships are definitely the the jobs that we enjoy the most at the moment. The the physical access stuff's fun as well. So I've kind of backed away from it um, because I, I find it a bit stressful. There's a group of us at the company who sneak into buildings or make our way into buildings by whichever way we can, really. And, you know, it, it's things like posing as someone to inspect the sprinkler system, uh, a building surveyor coming to check that you're compliant with disabled access rules, um, going to the Christmas party and pickpocketing someone and stealing the access card and then breaking into the building. Um, you know, there's all these these brilliant ways of, of doing things, but there's, there's nothing quite like, you feel a bit like James Bond. You know, you, you've been essentially permitted to do things that, that in all other circumstances would be, you know, really quite illegal. It's, it doesn't remove the exhilaration from it. So you've done this a bit, but not much anymore. Is that what you were saying? I used to do it a lot, but I found um, they take quite a long time and you quite often have to kind of, it, it, it's almost like um, method acting, I guess. Uh-huh. You're, you're becoming another person, but you're also being really dishonest to people. The time that hit me the hardest was um, I manipulated a receptionist into giving me a pass for the building for the next day. And... After the job had wrapped up, the receptionist got reprimanded in front of me for giving me that pass. And she was like visibly upset. And it just, it didn't feel like a good thing to be doing. It just, it, it I don't know, it really hit me. Just felt, I, 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 
the jobs are fun for me. I don't really think they provide great value to customers. You know, I think pretty much any building you can sneak into like that. And then, but then when you're kind of like making people feel bad and it's not really their fault, it kind of just, it just didn't gel well with me. So I kind of backed away from those jobs. Gotcha. And I see any, anyone could have a bad day and make a mistake, I guess. And yeah, do that. Yeah. We should probably wrap it though. I I could keep going forever. (laughs) No, it's been really good. It's been really interesting. I'm glad you feel that way. Do you want to give out your social media or website or anything like that? Well, Cyber Gibbons on Twitter is probably the best thing. I've got my website there. Yeah, if you Google Cyber Gibbons as well, loads of loads of interesting stories and vulnerabilities and things like that that come out. Uh, I'm not going to promote my company directly. Doesn't seem the right thing to do. But yeah, follow me on Twitter. Um, there's there's plenty of cryptocurrency stuff, drama, vulnerabilities, lots of IoT. Well, I really appreciate you giving me all this time. It was great to get all this information. Yeah, thanks. It's been it's been good having a chat. It's been interesting. Great. All right, I'll keep in touch. Thank you so much. Brilliant. Thanks for your time. Bye. Thanks for listening to episode 76 of the Bitcoin Game, a podcast I've put out usually on a monthly basis since October 2014. On Twitter, I'm the BTC Game, or send me an email. I'm Rob at the Bitcoin Game.com. Stay safe, everybody. See you guys later!